All right, three, two, one. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I have a very special guest. Her name is Tina Foster, and she's just published a book within the last four months. The title of the book is Plastic Macca, The Secret Death and Replacement of Beetle Paul McCartney. And it was published on January 22nd, 2019. I bought and read through the book. I'm also familiar with some of the material that she had posted on her blog. But she has agreed to an interview, and we're going to talk about uh, a subject with not a little controversy, a lot of controversy, which is whether this central figure of the, probably the most popular band in the world was replaced sometime in the 60s. So, Tina Foster, are you there? I sure am. How um, are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for agreeing to the interview. I'm glad to uh, that you uh, agreed to it. So, maybe what we can start off is uh, just talk a little bit about your background and how you became interested in this this peculiar subject. Okay, well, I was... I became a Beatles fan in high school, and I started reading biographies back then. And then I, you know, I heard about the Paul is Dead rumor, but I didn't put too much stock in it. This was before the internet. So, but I did wonder why Paul changed so much, why he went from hot to not, basically. But, you know, I was busy with life and getting graduate degrees, including two law degrees. And uh, then when I was getting my LLM in 2008, I came upon a website that had comps, comparison pictures of Paul and Fall. And I thought, well, I'll just look into it. You know, I was researching something else at the time. But that <laughs> a couple of minutes turned into 10 years now of researching the Paul is Dead conspiracy theory. And well, it took me about two or three days of intensely scrutinizing pictures of Paul and Fall before I could see the difference. And But once you see it, you, you can't unsee it. Right, <laughs> so, I agree. But then once I realized that Paul had been switched out, I the gravity of the situation hit me like a ton of bricks because this is such a devastating psyop because Paul was so loved by he was loved by so many people. And that they could actually pull this off by switching out somebody that famous and popular it's it's a scary situation and i first just set out i got angry and i set out to show that paul had been replaced and you know i was busy on the forums and i started a blog in 2009 i started doing radio shows in 2009 actually talking about paul having been replaced but people they they want they demand that that you have all the answers for them as far as why and where and who and how so then i developed a theory based on the clues and the evidence and the reverse speech and just common sense about what happened to him and i try and i i lay it all out in plastic maca and i try to explain what I think happened to him and And there's so much there there's so many things that hint so many people have said off-color strange remarks including uh this new person I agree with you I think he was switched I just say that at the outset and that the word fall comes from not from you it comes from other people surrounding this new person that's what they called him correct yes and actually when I was reading biographies back in high school I saw that John Lennon called him faux Paul. And I really was, I wondered about that. I was like, what is that about? But then, of course, now it makes sense. But I I haven't been able to find that reference again. But But there's little pieces within the uh, studio albums. Maybe we can just talk about who the original McCartney was and what happened and how and what the timing of his what you think is his original death and how this new person was uh, was his replacement? Well, James Paul McCartney was the, the the original Beatle, and he 
was a genius musician, in my opinion. He wrote Yesterday and Eleanor Rigby, and he was a a darned good bass player. You know, he could play and sing, didn't watch the fretboard. He could uh, spin around on stage and, and not miss a beat. And uh, Left-handed too, right? And left-handed, yes. He was completely left-handed. He said in a 1963 interview that he did everything left-handed. He even used to write backwards. So then, you know, the Beatles were touring. They did uh, world tours. And then the last one ended in 66 with the U.S. tour, the end of August 66. And that's when I think he was switched out. Was sixty six um, something happened in sixty six? Yes, and that that corresponds with the Paul's dead story that's been going on for fifty years. You know, it first um, surfaced in sixty seven. People were talking about how Paul died in an accident, a car accident, and then it it, it was under the surface, and then in sixty nine it became really big news that something happened to Paul and, and people just thought it was a car accident. I don't think it was a simple car accident. I don't, I, I think that there was more to it, uh, mm-hmm. that he was, that, it, that he was taken out on purpose because he was not willing to serve the agenda in the Beatles were very influential and popular. And they had a lot of sway over uh, not just young people, but you know they had a huge audience. Huge cultural impact, probably the most in, in the early '60s, the most important band, right? And so when he supposedly died and was replaced, was a huge cultural change in the band too, right? Oh yeah, so that everything changed from '66 to '67. That ushered in the Summer of Love and the LSD. Um, the culture, the psychedelic, basically, if if you look deeper under to the deeper causes, I do believe that uh, the Beatles and not only Paul, but they were speaking out against the Vietnam War, which I think could have been problematic for them. Uh, Paul was getting getting interested in the JFK assassination. He didn't buy the official story, and he was he was offering to write the score for Mark Lane's Rush to Judgment, and he, he didn't believe that Oswald was the lone gunman or anything. Mm-hmm. So I think that would also be another problem for them. And he, they were against segregation, which. It was an institution in the American South. So again, that was problematic. And uh, so I think they were just too influential to have these views that were going against the, um, well, the deep state or the Illuminati, whatever people are calling them now. <laughs> right. Well, um, there is a kind of an occult aspect to the new Beatles, the post-Paul Beatles. There is like... You know, there's just all kinds of stuff in Sergeant Pepper's references, occult references, drug references, uh, new age type ideas that did not were not they were not precedent. They weren't there with the old Paul, whose personality was much more kind of saccharine and the nice guy personality, where this new one much different. Right, and so Paul, there was there's no history of drug use for Paul other than maybe a, a couple of prolies when they were playing Hamburg all night long, but he was not much of a drug user. And he, uh, I don't think that he would have, he, he would not have pushed the drug agenda in my opinion, just from his personality saying outright in 1965, he said that uh, people had tried to get them to, to get people to, either not smoke or not drink or do whatever. And he said that they would never tell their fans what to do or not to do. So they were not going to be pushing any agendas. So then when, when fall steps in, you know, he was the first British pop star to talk openly on TV about taking LSD. So 
here you have somebody who's very influential being used as it's almost like a celebrity advertisement uh, and people did get interested in trying it because you know their hero Paul McCartney liked LSD so oh we have to try it and Fall even admitted that he knew that would happen so right so he's, and, promo he's definitely promoting it yes exactly and so, you know, LSD isn't some harmless drug. It's a psychochemical warfare agent, and it was unleashed into the population as an experiment in mind control. And then, you know, Timothy Leary talked about that and also coupling it with psychedelic music, which was also, um, you know, there was, it was flourishing and, and on purpose. Right. So this was all part of an agenda to probably hijack the Vietnam war protesters this was all part of it and there are connections between the beatles and leary they're uh post paul there are two songs that were written about timothy leary a reference leary did you know that yeah i yeah. do but i'm i can't blank. remember the name i'd have to pull it yeah. up it's in my book children of the beast but yeah there's there's definitely connections there so you see that the the post paul beatles become cultural change agents towards illuminati illumined occult principles Exactly. And so Aleister Crowley is, an, is a big figure there, but, you know, there's the occult aspect that he was also MI5 and he was a co-founder of the Tavistock Institute. Crowley was? Yes. So I would I, like to see that reference. I'm, I'm not sure that's fully true, but he oh, definitely, okay. he was actually before MI5. Crowley was a member of the Special Intelligence Service. Which, well, uh, Tavistock, I mean, I've got all that stuff in the book. But, um, um, so I think that his prominence probably is due to that. But the occult is, you know, that is also, uh, that also plays into it. But I think that the controllers, the powers that be, the Illuminati, saw an opportunity there with the Beatles rather than just stamping out the pesky beetle. They decided to use and, and exploit his influence and popularity to push the agenda, push the cultural, uh, social engineering social in a certain direct direction. Yeah, you know, using his good name. <laughs> right. I mean, so they have this new person who, uh, in '66, the Beatles went on like a hiatus, right? Or '67, and by '69, or there's a new guy who shows up. He was an inch taller, different eye color, different ears. Yeah. Um, all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the end of the U.S. tour, that was uh, the, the Beatles basically disappeared for about four months until December of 66, which was very unusual because they had been always in the limelight and some pictures, they were the most photographed subject of the 1960s. So that was strange. And then they announced that they were never going to tour again, which was also strange. And um, so they, so Fall, I think he makes his first appearance in LA on August 28th, 1966. I don't think that's the, the real Paul anymore. Mm -hmm. Certainly by November, it's not Paul because there, there's a there, there's a video of him in Kenya, which is definitely the new guy. And then December of 66, outside of EMI Studios, there's a short interview, and you can tell that's not the real Paul anymore. His nose is a lot longer, for one thing. And the, the newer Paul's in the interview, he looks dazed and confused, like he's... He doesn't have that kind of confidence and, you know, there's, there's clearly some type of like even visual body language signaling that's totally different. Right. Yeah. He, he's not comfortable in Paul's skin, basically. Yeah. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of forensic evidence and voice prints to that prove that it's not the same Paul. So we're not just making this up. We have two forensic scientists who actually set out to prove that the Paul is dead rumor was just a rumor. And they surprised themselves because they found six physical differences. Uh, one was the skull shape, which, you know, doesn't change with an adult. So that's, you can't explain that away. Um, Paul's 
head was rounder and falls is more elongated. He let his face grow long, basically, right? right. And um, and then also the nasal spine was different, and they suspected that the mustache that fell started sporting, and the end of 66 was meant to conceal that. Gotcha. And the jawline was different. The teeth and the palate were different. And uh, the tragus, which is part of the ear, were, was different. Right, and you cannot change the the, the um, palate. Like the pal- you can do surgeries to adjust or move things, but the palate, uh, you know, you'd have to go through a very intensive surgery to do that. Yeah, it's extensive surgery where they would have had to have inserted a prosthetic into his palate. And then he would have had to have worn braces for a year. So that obviously didn't happen. Right. So you can't. So how do you explain these differences other than it's a different person? Right. You can't. And right. really, one physical difference would be enough to betray a double. I mean, I write about that in the splitting image, too, that these spies that are uh, wearing disguises and trying to get past border guards or whatever, you know, one misplaced eyebrow could give them away and actually cost them their lives. So mm-hmm. here we have Fall, who's a very sloppy double. <laughs> right. You know, but right. people, they want to believe that it's the same one because they want to believe the fantasy. Right. Well, it's it, pretty hard to believe people can switch out unless you're kind of like in an Intel or you've heard of all the other doubles or. I mean, most uh, political leaders have always had doubles, probably going back for hundreds of years. And, yeah, so it's it's a tough one to to come to the conclusion that that the guy was changed out. But there's just so many indicators that, you know, something was going on. Well, that's why I wrote the splitting image. It it was uh, meant to be a primer for the plastic maca book because it's documenting the history of doubles and known cases and that how much technology is involved and the sophistication of the disguises and the plastic surgery, how far back all of that goes. It goes back to medieval times. Not maybe plastic surgery, but certainly they were using doubles in right. medieval times as part of the psyops. And all sorts of reasons. I mean, there are decoys for important public figures, politicians, or whatnot, right. all the way up to somebody actually being imposter replaced. That was shown in The Man in the Iron Mask, how they were trying to stage a coup, right, by right. putting the king's twin in, and he, he was basically a controlled puppet. That was the idea. And that's what I think happened with Paul. Have you ever seen the Kurosawa film Kajimusha? I have not. Which is basically about that. They have a D, they have a double. They have a double for the king so that they're tricking their enemies uh, that it's the same person. So they dress him up like the king and he slowly becomes the king. He starts to take on his mannerisms. He learns his mannerisms. It's a really remarkable film if you get a chance. Yeah. And there's like a word for Kaj. It's a, it's a known word in Japan which means like body double, you know? So it's something that in the Japanese culture that they know of. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, there's like Stalin's doubles, they received training in how to mimic Stalin. Like they, one was an actor. He actually went to study with another actor who was playing Stalin in films. And... One of Saddam Hussein's doubles was actually assassinated back in the 80s because he, they thought he was the real Hussein. So, you know, Kim Jong-il is another one who supposedly died in 2002 and then a, about four doubles were trotted out as needed so that the military elite could keep control. Yes, right. Just like Kajimusha. Interesting. Yeah, it's remarkable. Yeah. I would actually think that Hillary Clinton had a double during the 2016 election. Did you ever see that person who walked out of the the place in New York after she flopped on September 11th, 2016? Yes. I wrote about that in the splitting image. Um, I mean, we know there's a Teresa Barnwell who is a a pretty famous celebrity impersonator of Hillary. So I don't know if she was the one who they tried it out later or if there's a different 
I, I doubt that somebody they would use as an imposter would be anybody that we would have heard of. Heard of right. Interesting. So, <laughs> and, right. No, but no, I mean, you're making great points because it all puts this person in context. Who, who is this new person? Where does he come from? Why was he switched out? I mean, the Beatles were hanging out with pretty sketchy characters too. And they're famous. They, there's pictures of them with Jimmy Savile, who has all mm-hmm. kinds of occult. I mean, he's basically a witch died and buried as a vampire and, just engage in all kinds of sketchy stuff, you know? And, and also, uh, when I was reading biographies uh, back in high school, you know, I read that the Beatles, once they made it big, they did not allow new people into their group because they had trust issues, mm-hmm. basically. And then Paul disappears, and then suddenly Yoko Ono comes in, and also Linda Eastman. But it appears that Linda Eastman was already together with Paul before he ever became Paul. Interesting. And that was something that Jay Marks talked about when he went to an, the engagement party for Jane Asher and Paul McCartney. He was confused. He's like, well, why is Paul hanging out with the girl with the camera? And somebody told him, oh, that's that's the new Paul. Right. There was like it, weird things. Yeah. 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 <laughs> It said, oh, don't you know that's his replacement? It's all very hush-hush. So there's all yeah, kinds of little things going on that kind of give it away. Oh, so much. Yeah. So I much. Mean, yeah. And even like the you were talking about all the plastic surgery, there's pictures of him. It looks like he has already had plastic surgery. Like his lips look like he, he has injuries or something. Oh, yeah. No, the plastic surgeons say there, there's telltale, there are telltale signs of plastic surgery on yeah. him, even though he denies it. And then he takes on, like, he's a very clean-shaven guy for all of his life, and then all of a sudden it's beard and mustache and big hair and, you know. And unkempt. Unkempt, yeah. And, and even Jeff Emmerich, who was there, one of the sound engineers, he... I think he was hinting at the change without getting himself in trouble. But he would say, oh, the Beatles were all great friends and, and well-dressed and and fun to be around. And then practically overnight, they're, they hate each other. They're they're not fun, and they are all scruffy looking. So. Right, like something <laughs> happened fast. And then they broke up in the 70s, right? Yeah, like 1970. So it happened yeah. fast. So this guy gets switched. Beatles come out with Sgt. Peppers, the band breaks up, the fall, the new guy starts Wings and does not have a lot of success. So it's, he's clearly not the same kind of talent that Paul McCartney, the original Paul, was in the early and mid-60s. Right. It seems like. No, I agree. I think that the, some of the songs, I mean, Paul would never have released some of those. But um, it is kind of funny with Fall how he... You know, he admits that he can't play Day Trip or Live or Nowhere Man, and he doesn't know the chords for A Hard Day's Night. <laughs> wow. That's incredible. <laughs> That's incredible. And there's actually pictures in some of their movies where the new guy is holding the guitar the wrong way, right? Like, he picks it up as a right-handed, switches it back. Yeah, and, and Penny Lane, in Penny Lane, you know, there's this brief moment where they're all sitting around this table and fall goes to take the bass and play right hand and he, he corrects himself quickly but you mm-hmm. you can see that and then there are also pictures of him playing bass or guitar right handed now people will say the pictures are switched or flipped but one of them is in the anthology which is an official Beatles release okay from like 95 but they put in a picture of Paul uh, playing right-handed guitar in in India during, I think they're playing I Will at the time. But I say, look, even if that's flipped, then that is a big clue that they've just dropped for you in that movie. Because they know what they're doing. Either their purpose, well, they're showing either that he's playing right-handed just straight up, or they flipped it, but I think that would be a clue. I see. I mean, but there's other visual markers too, right? Through all the Sergeant Peppers and some of the back masking you talk about. Paul is yes. dead. There's just all kind. There's just not one thing. It's just over and over. They're referencing. I think at one point, uh, Ringo Starr said, "I'm the only one left." Right after yes. Harrison dies. 
Yes, Ringo said in 2011 that he was the last remaining Beatle, and that is, um, you know, that's an, a real article that you can verify because I know there's some fake news things out there. But then they're like, haha, it's a joke. And then they're like, well, but even the best jokes have some element of truth in them. It's like, sure. <laughs> you know, I mean, but so that's they're... kind of like actually kind of an occult thing. Like it's a big joke, but we're serious. And he's been, actually saw an interview with Paul, Paul McCartney on Letterman where he makes the occult sign of silence, you know, which, you know, on a surface just means be quiet. But I mean, it has a dark, it goes back through Crowley. It has a very deep Western esoteric, you know, progeny. It's incredible. So oh, you know, there... all, do you ever see the picture of Fall where he's carrying the golden apple where he's walking through, I think the it was the Indica Gallery. I don't think I've seen that one. I think if you look, find that, because that gold apple is like the golden apple of chaos by the great Greek goddess Callisti. If you find that, in that, if you look through, there's a real deep occult importance to that. When I saw that, I was just like, whoa. And he's like carrying it out in his hand, in one hand, like he wants people to see it. It's really a trip. Okay. So keep an eye out for that, yeah. Yes. Um, but there are some pretty dire consequences if you're a member of the Illuminati and you betray their secrets i mean they they say they'll bury you up to your neck in the sand and do horrible things to you like take your tongue out and stuff so right well I the mean, masonic you know all the masonic uh you know initiations are all kinds of cut your throat all kinds of bad stuff so yeah so and, and we do have people that have been threatened and people who i mean heather mills was threatened with death Right. And Mal Evans was shot to death right before he was going to release his tell-all book. Tell -all book. Why don't you talk a little bit about Mal Evans for people who don't know who he was? Malcolm well, Evans. Well, he he was the, the Beatles' roadie for 10 years, and he worked for them, and he helped Fall write songs on Sgt. Pepper, like Fixing a Hole and um, the theme song. And then he moved to L.A. in the early 70s, and... He was writing a, a tell-all biography about the Beatles called Living the Beatles Legend. Well, he one week before he was going to take his book to the publisher, he, he reached an agreement with Fall about the song royalties. And then he, warned, he told his collaborator on the book to make sure the book got released. And then he was shot to death by police. Right. Like this and all happened right, like you know, the same day or a couple, few, couple, you know, couple of days. Very suspicious shooting, too, right? I mean, yeah, something. Yeah, right. yeah because like his girlfriend, who was probably a honeypot, she called the police and said that he was waving a rifle around. It turned out to be an air rifle, but the police came in and shot him. Then you know his book went missing. His suitcase full of memorabilia went missing and even his ashes went missing on the way back to England. It's incredible. So every, that book has never been published either, right? It's lost. Well, the, the book, it was found again, but it was redacted. So wow. we don't know what he was going to put in there, but yeah, it was heavily edited. Nothing was revealed. And wasn't fall, wasn't uh, Mal, Malcolm Evans with fall in Kenya? Like aren't yes. there? Yeah, so he was around and knew all the sketchy stuff. And the, like Fall did all kinds of weird stuff too. He like went to Scotland, and he just had these strange mannerisms when people are interviewing him. And even that, even the other ones is when they were asked about the death of John Lennon, he's like chewing gum. Oh, like he just might as well have clipped his toenail. Like oh, some guy who, that's mm -hmm. an amazing clip too. It's a drag, isn't it? Like yeah. he seemed very irritated. I yeah. think that Fall resents the original Beatles. I think he resents Paul. Like even there was a new thing he said where he was never a fan of P and, <laughs> and, uh, and I think he gets irritated because people always say, Oh, yesterday and Eleanor Rigby are so great. And he's like, Oh, like, why don't you talk about my songs? You know, right, it's like, okay, your songs are crap, but nobody wants to hear your songs <laughs> like Fuh you and frog chorus. Come on, please. But, and, um, um, just another thing that adds to the Brit the the Beatles mystique and the oddities of surrounding it is the death of John Lennon because it involved like a mind controlled patsy, Mark David Chapman, 
who was reading Catcher in the Rye and just very casual and, blue, you know, she supposedly shot Lennon and went and sat back down in Central Park. And, yeah. you know, that whole story is even kind of uh, doesn't really verify the Paul is dead uh, story, but it, it also just shows all of the all the people around. And, and Lennon was on like a hit list from the FBI. I mean, so there's all kinds of really heavy duty political people who were which bolsters your position that political people were very involved in what the Beatles were doing and what they were saying. Well, I do think that the John Lennon assassination is suspicious, and I did write write it up on my Plastic NACA blog that, uh, you know, there was a famous book by Fenton Bressler, who was a barrister in England, um, The Murder of John Lennon, I think it's called, but he talks about how Mark David Chapman was probably an intelligence asset, and he flew from Hawaii to New York twice to shoot John Lennon. Right. And like you said, he as soon as he shot him, or if he shot him, because Jose, Jose Paderno was the doorman, doorman he was right, right. CIA guy who had been in at the Bay of Pigs. Right. So you know, he could have been a shooter. But um, And also Yoko Ono. I mean, apparently... Well, I was told by somebody who purported to know that the Japanese government did an investigation themselves because Yoko Ono is such a high-profile Japanese citizen. And apparently they thought that she was one of the shooters. But wow. that's just going from somebody who is, um, well, you know, anyway, claims to know. But Well, she's an oddball, too. Definitely both into the occult, doing all kinds of weird stuff at that uh, Dakota. They were had, like, cow tongues, and they were doing... They made sure the baby was born at the right date. And he's totally into the occult, too. Uh, The last person to see Mark David Chapman is Kenneth Anger, who freaked out after Lenin... I mean, so you had... Who's basically, like, a part of the Manson family through Bobby Boozley. So these connections are absolutely incredible. Oh, yeah. No, it's very suspicious. And then the doctor... Well, okay, so John Lennon is shot, and the doctor admits that he destroyed evidence, destroyed his clothing. Wow. Oh, and then Mark David Chapman was sitting down reading A Catcher in the the Rye, just waiting for the police. So that's... I mean, that's a mind-controlled... Right, written by a guy who was in uh, military intelligence, right? Salinger in World War II... And uh, he, uh, Mark David Chapman was in, I think, either Vietnam or some other Asian country under Worldview, which was a full CIA a, operation. He was in Beirut. I Beirut, that. okay. Yeah. Do you know, have you heard of the whole story of like World Vision, I think it was called? Not Worldview. Was that like a CIA front? CIA front, yeah. Yeah. So, um, and also the nurse didn't believe that it was John Lennon when, you know, he came into the hospital and... Um, so there's a whole lot of weird stuff around that. But, you know, they they took him out. And if it's, you know, even the role of John Lennon, who knows. But uh, if they took him out, and then there was also the attack on George Harrison, the knife attack, right. you know, right, the 2000 turn of this millennium. And so, yes, if they're going to take out two Beatles or try, then why not Paul, right. who was... But see, people don't think that Paul was as political as he was because the new guy is just a controlled puppet for the New World Order. I mean, he he loves Obama. He's coming out for gun control. You know, right. <laughs> it's, like, it's my, almost my... like somebody created somebody with those ideas. He doesn't. And then, yeah, it's incredible. Oh, I don't mean to interrupt. You, I'm sorry. Um, but Paul also said that he wit- he personally witnessed. A plane hit the World Trade Center on 9-11. And what are the chances? Wow. So, um... Well, see, that can be taken in two ways, right? So, you can say, oh, that's just a very rare occurrence. Or, you can say, he's an illumined, you know? Which, oh, yeah. Which, 9-11 is a illumin- illumined event. Yeah, well, he's he's supporting the official story of 9-11. It's like, oh, yeah, I saw mm-hmm. it happen. Like, come on, right? Yeah. But, um... So I didn't know that. Met- I wasn't aware of that Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, see, it just gets so deep, man. Because the Beatles really were the very influential. I mean, and I think that he was, I don't think that uh, the original Paul was a dope smoker, but this new Fall is a big-time 
the pothead, right? Wasn't he? Oh yeah, yeah he is. So. He used his own children as drug mule drug mules to get him into Japan <sighs> with with marijuana back in 1980. So you know we we talk about that too. That you know, Fall comes into Japan for a concert. They find marijuana, or they say they find marijuana, whatever happened, and then they hold him for ten days, and then they release him. I don't think he was allowed back in for a while, but. You know, it, it just seems a little bit strange, and so people think that maybe the fingerprints didn't match from when mm-hmm. Paul was there in '66, and they were holding him, trying to figure out like what is going on here, and then they, you know, talk to British intelligence or whatever, and then it's like, okay, just get out, <laughs> get out, leave, don't, don't come back. Do you know of any? But I mean, and even the death of Epstein was somewhat suspicious too. Their manager, who supposedly overdosed and died in bed, right? Yes, like, that's true. That's another kind of. Does that really happen? You know, you kind of got to back, go back and look at a lot of the stuff that these there, guys were around and up to. And, yeah. There are a lot of dead bodies. You know, there's a right. lot of a lot of stuff. Pretty sad, pretty sad story. But you know, you mentioned Scotland earlier, and I think that's a good point because Paul did buy this farm in Scotland, Campbelltown, back in June of '66, and he bought it for a, a basically a tax write-off or you know whatever his mm-hmm. fi- finances. But he loved London. He just he bought a house in London, and he loved to be on the scene and to go see concerts and plays. And he was a, he was very urban. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then Fall basically takes his family and moves up to Scotland, this remote farm, and disappears. Yeah, that's another strange thing. Yeah. It just doesn't. It seems not to be a characteristic of Paul. I do not think Paul would have ever done that. Well, wasn't the, there speculation that the fall is Scottish and that that's where he is from and that might have been why? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of speculation about where fall is from. There was a Paul McCartney lookalike contest that was held in Scotland and Keith Allison was the official winner, but... Fall could easily have been recruited from that. Gotcha. You know, that could have been staged as a way to find a, a Paul lookalike for that purpose. But, you know, people have told me who are from Liverpool or from England, and they say that Fall's accent is not from Liverpool. Right. So it's changed. Like, Liverpool is very distinctive. So right. the new Fall, yeah. Yeah, so... You know, he's faking some British accent, or maybe he's British, but he's not having the correct Liverpudlian accent. But certainly he's a native English speaker, but where, in which, from which country is still to be determined. To be so. determined. And it, one, what was his wife after Linda Eastman? He had the girlfriend who said she, on TV, she had all this information. She didn't want to put it out, but like everything pointed to inside information about fall right right heather mills Mills, was his second wife and she freaked about something because back in 2007 she came out on tv on mainstream media saying you know i've left you protect me and i'll say nothing and something so horrible happened that people didn't want to know the truth and she was getting serious death threats because there was so much fear of the truth coming out from by a particular party, and you can guess who that was, that she said she put evidence in a box in case they topped her off, which, you know, means to kill her. Mm-hmm. And if if she were killed, that the truth would come out. And uh, so she basically got a nice big payout for her divorce and uh, has kept quiet. Quiet. She know her around. Nobody even knows where yeah. she is. And I, she has an interesting background too. I, my understanding is that she was a prostitute for, or an escort. You know, that's really how she got her start. I don't know how she met Fall, but um, I think they met at some charity, or at least that's the official version. But you know, I think she has integrity. She found out, and she was like, "Oh hell no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to be a part of that." Part of this, you know, yeah. She said somebody betrayed her, so 
somebody she loved betrayed her and, and it wasn't infidelity. And I don't even think like people could say, well, maybe he was abusive, which she apparently was, but she, you know, she put that in her court papers and documents. I don't think that that would be the secret that she couldn't reveal because she did. It was in her court document. So something, and you know, we can imagine what that would be. <laughs> Right. And I mean, when when the whole controversy started, there was I mean, at the original time of this change, there was a lot of hubbub. F. Lee Bailey, you know, investigated. There was all kinds of people really looking into it. And uh, so it wasn't like this just popped up. The Internet allowed people to compare all the pictures and notice the obvious discrepancies. But um yeah, I mean, this kind of controversy goes back. And I think that there was a lot to cover it up because I saw a Time magazine about the Beatles. And I was looking, I was like, I think somebody's like done a Stalin job on some of these pictures. They've oh, yes. been doctored. That's I mean, actually been proven because okay. the, for, the forensic scientists who were trying to disprove Paula's diet, actually, they proved it. They looked at all the pictures and they saw telltale signs of photo tampering wow. and they thought it had already started back as soon as Paul was switched. Wow. And I've seen terrible hack jobs. I mean, just embarrassing, embarrassingly bad Photoshop jobs, unofficial pictures. And right, one, right, of, right. one of them was from Memphis on August 19th, 1966. And you can tell it's an obvious hack job. And I actually wrote um, it, it, the the images for sale, and I wrote and I said, well, how, "Why are you selling this picture? That's an obvious forgery or but, you know, doctored photo." And of course, they never got back to me. But I've got it on my blog. You know, you can see what Paul looked like from that day. There, there are pictures and video, and then you can compare it to this official picture that's for sale, and you can tell that it's. <laughs> wow, it's, just, it's incredible i mean it's yeah. really it's just a bra some of this stuff is just brazen like the the those are supposedly official pictures and it just looks like <laughs> i went i mean i don't know anything about graphics graphic design but it looks like something i would do like okay let's just <laughs> blur this yeah. out let's put this you know mat on here i mean it's really bad yeah they totally took bad. out it looks like they took the bottom of Paul's face and just stuck it, superimposed it onto Paul's. And you can yes, see yeah. this V shape in the cheek, which your cheek doesn't have a V shape. But there is one there. And then there's stubble, which he didn't have that day. And then the hair is completely black. Like they just magic markered the hair and the eye, eyebrows too. But, you know, Paul's hair had highlights on it. And so, you know, I point out these differences on the blog, and I think I talk about them in the book, too. But um... Yeah, it's amazing. And those forensics that looked at it were Italian forensic sciences who just published their stuff independently. They weren't working with any other investigators or anything like that. They just, these are our findings. Like, this guy's not, this guy's not Paul McCarthy. Yeah, I don't think that, I, they were surprised by their findings. I don't think they, well, they said they were setting out to disprove it. So right. they they found all these differences and they published it in Wired, gotcha. Wired Italia. And a lot of us wrote to Wired to get them to publish it in English. And of course, they're not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole. Right. But, um, you know, these, these, these forensic scientists, Carlesi and Gabazzini, it did not help their careers, you know. Right. <laughs> I'm, so believe, I'm not surprised. Yeah, it didn't help them. They didn't gain anything from coming out with the truth, you know, they just had integrity to actually publish what they found and to not whitewash it. But, you know, another person was Dr. Henry Truby from the University of Miami, who ran the voice print analysis back in 69. And, you know, he said that there was Paul who sang yesterday, and then one voice double who sang Penny Lane, and then another voice double who sang Hey Jude. And, you know, he was on the radio talking about it with Roby Young, and then Roby Young tried to follow up with him, and Henry Truby was like, oh, no, I can't talk about this anymore. Wow. And so they got to him and, and probably threatened his career or whatever they did, but, yeah, he wouldn't talk about it. But too late, the cat was out of the bag, you know. <laughs> right. But, yeah, I mean, it's just there's just so many pieces. 
So, Tina, we are at 45 minutes. Is there anything that you think that we should cover or uh, anything else that you would like to talk to before we wrap this up? Um, no, I mean, I think that the, pe the people should look at the forensics. I've always focused on that the most because that's proof that Paul was replaced. And then we have to get into the clues and, and the astrology and the Bible code and the reverse speech to try to figure out what happened to Paul. And I go into all of that in the book, you know. Right. The symbols, the colors, all that stuff, yeah. And I mean, that, what's really scary is that he could have been murdered, you know. Murdered, that's what I murdered. think. He was assassinated. And it's it's bone-chilling to mm. think that they got away with this. And this is some super evil agenda to just switch somebody out right under your nose and then nobody notices. That's yeah. terrifying. And and then, um, you know, I, I would really like to see Paul's legacy restored so that it's not conflated with fall. That's an that interesting was, point. Yeah. You know, set the record straight here because Paul had some really brilliant songs and and then people think that he wrote Fe You, which is just, I'm sorry, but it's an embarrassment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, um, <laughs> what about ebony and ivory I yeah mean, see that <laughs> what do you, you don't know if some of these guys are being ghost written you know you don't know who's writing the songs who's producing who's behind it you know i don't yeah. i haven't done the research on it maybe it's overt it's obvious that somebody else wrote those songs but um there, there's a lot of speculation about well who wrote some of the songs after paul i mean i I know that She's Leaving Home was a Paul song because the voice prints prove it. So they had some songs in the can that they could use gotcha. from Paul or at least ideas because he said he recorded everything that he wrote. Gotcha. So they, they probably mined all of his stuff. And then maybe when they ran out of material is when um, Paul's songs got really bad. But... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he could have ghost writers, sure. Sure, could... they all do. I don't think Madonna's ever written a song in her whole career. She just gets right. Insane. I mean, Elvis, right. I don't know if he was a songwriter. I think he had a lot of his stuff written for him, so. Sure. You know. um, and so your blog is still extant. It's Plastic Macca, right? Yes, plasticmacca.blogspot.com. Gotcha. And that word Macca comes from kind of McCartney. England. Pardon me? McCartney, it's, right? Yeah, it's, that's what they call him, uh, McCartney and Macca in England. So right. I actually got the title from the Who's song Substitute. I see right through your plastic Mac. Wow, yeah. Plastic Macca. So it's like, yeah, I see right through you, Paul. You know, you're not fooling me. <laughs> right. And your book came out uh, just January 22nd. You have 24 five-star reviews. So, uh, Thank you. And it's 512. Very well detailed footnoted which i 100 percent appreciate so i love to read a book that has over a thousand footnotes you know so people can actually just follow up where you're reading so it's really fantastic your other book is the splitting image exposing the secret world of doubles decoys and where's this dumb thing what's the rest Imposter of the time imposter replacement imposter replacement sorry i got so. all the keywords in there <laughs> did you cover in the spitting image did you cover the uh replacement of roosevelt during world war ii I think I might have mentioned him in there. Because there's there some, something there's, with the ear. Yeah. If you look at the pictures right there at Yalta, I think that they replaced him. They didn't want to, there was, you know, just like anything else, they didn't want to have him die during the war and people get dejected. So they replaced him because he was sick. Okay. Yeah. But, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I'll have to send you the picture, but it doesn't look like the original Roosevelt at all. Super skinny. Um, but yeah. So, I mean, these things do happen. Sure does. All right. Tina Foster, the book again, the title of which is Plastic Macca, The Secret Death and Replacement of Beetle, Paul McCartney. Go get it. Check it out. It's really good. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right.